So I am a biochemist and a neuroscientist, but I'm also a husband and a father. And I've spent much of my career trying to understand how the brain guides us through some of the most important aspects of our lives, our relationships with others. And uh, we all know how important relationships are in our lives. They can be exhilarating, exciting, and, but they also can be very disrupting if they are dissolved. And so I am really interested in understanding how the brain creates this excitement, this bond between each other, and what happens when that bond is disrupted. Now, as humans, we have several different kinds of relationships. Some of these relationships are evolutionarily very ancient. For example, the bond between the mother and the, the offspring. You can see that in virtually all mammals. A bond forms. It's one of the strongest bonds that you'll ever find. But humans also have different kinds of relationships that you don't see in other animals. And that, for example, the relationships between mothers and fathers, lovers. In most animals, 97% of mammals, males and females, don't form a relationship that goes beyond sex. They mate, and the female is off to have her own offspring. And so I'm interested in understanding both how those emotions arise and how they evolved and what is the basis of that. Now, one of the ideas that I have is that these most human emotions, even the most human emotions, have evolutionary roots in uh, animals. And I believe that if you're under interested in understanding the chemistry of how our brain regulates these emotions, you have to, you cannot do this by studying only humans. You have to study animals. And this is the approach that I've been doing. I've been studying the biology of relationships using these animals. These are called prairie voles. These are little hamster-sized rodents from the Midwestern United States. They're different from rats, mice, and most other animals that you know about. Because these animals, when they come together, a male and a female come together, they, they court. And if they mate, there's a transformation that occurs in the brain so that they form a bond. And that bond lasts a lifetime. They nest together. They raise their offspring together. The male spends just as much time rearing the offspring as does the female. And this provides us an opportunity to study the brains of these guys to figure out what causes these emotions? Now, we say these guys are socially monogamous, which means that they form these lifelong relationships. But I will tell you that if a male is wandering through the prairie and another female comes by who's an estrus, she may actually mate, he may actually mate with her. But the important thing is that he comes back to his partner. So what we're studying here, <laughs> what I'm talking about here today is not sexual monogamy, but is the formation of these bonds. Now, I believe that these bonds are regulated by chemical reactions that are occurring between neurons and well-defined chemical circuits, or neuro neurochemical circuits. And I want to introduce uh, one chemical that plays an important role. This chemical is called oxytocin. You may have heard this. This plays an important role in, the, in birth, in labor. It's released from the brain, causes the uterus to contract during labor. Once the baby is born, the baby begins to nurse. Neural signals go up to the brain, stimulates the release of oxytocin, and that causes milk to be ejected so the mother, the, the mother can provide nutrients to the offspring. But we also know that when that molecule is released within the brain, when that mother gives birth and when she's nursing, it creates a bond between that mother and the baby. This is why when she's nursing, when she's looking at her baby, this oxytocin molecule is causing her, to, her brain to believe that this baby is the most important thing in her world. It's a very powerful chemical. We also know that this molecule is also involved in other kinds of relationships as well. And how do we know that? So these are the prairie voles, and these are the kinds of experiments we can do. Normally, prairie voles have to mate in order before they can form these bonds. But if we take a virgin female prairie vole and inject her brain with a little bit of oxytocin and place her with a male just for a few hours, and she sees that male, smells that male, within those few hours, if her brain is bathed with oxytocin, she forms a bond with that male. So for example, we can just inject her brain with one chemical, put her with a male, and she forms this bond. Now, one of the cool things about studying voles is that there are different species of voles that have different kinds of behaviors. Prairie voles are highly social. They form these bonds. Other voles, like the metal vole here, is asocial. They don't care to interact with others. They mate, but after they mate, the male goes off to try to find another female. So this gives us an opportunity to look in the brain to see what is different about an animal that can form a bond versus one that cannot. And given that oxytocin is important, we began to look at the oxytocin system to see what's different. They both have oxytocin, but what's different 
is in the distribution in the brain of the receptors that allow the neurons to respond to that oxytocin. These dark areas are areas, of the, are, are, uh, areas that have high concentrations of oxytocin receptors. And what you can see is that in some areas, like this area called the nucleus accumbens, this is the brain's reward center. This is where cocaine acts. This is where addiction occurs. This area is loaded with these oxytocin receptors in the monogamous species. If you look in the guides who cannot form the bond, you see very little receptors there. So we can actually tell the difference in these species easier by looking at the chemistry in the brain than we can by looking at their outside appearance. And I think that's just fascinating. And we know that these receptors are important because if we can go in and inject a tiny amount of this oxytocin receptor blocker into this area, the female, and place the female with a male, and let her mate with that male even for 24 hours. The next day we test her, she doesn't care about that male whatsoever. So we can control this bonding process through a single molecule. Now males, we also have oxytocin, but we also have another molecule that probably plays a more important role in bonding, and that's called vasopressin. Vasopressin in many other species is involved in territorial behavior, but in voles, this molecule is creating the bond between the male and the female. And again, you see in the brain that the difference between the species that can form the bonds and not is in where the receptors are that can respond to this molecule. So we can see a chemical signature in the brain of this monogamous behavior. And we know that those receptors are important because if we block those receptors, they cannot form bonds. Now we did an experiment that I think is just really mind-blowing. We took the gene that encodes for the vasopressin receptor from the monogamous species, and we injected that gene in a virus, like gene therapy, into this area of the brain of the non-monogamous species. Again, this area is involved in reward and addiction. So that we created metal brains here down at the bottom that have the same expression pattern as the monogamous perivole, but in every other regard, they were still the asocial metal voles. When we put these transformed metal voles with a female and allowed them to mate, and then we tested them, these animals had formed a bond with that partner. So this shows that you can transform social behavior, even complex behavior like bonding, just by changing the expression of a single gene in a single brain area. And that's because we have regions of our brain that are involved in different processes like reward and reinforcement. Now, oxytocin and vasopressin are not the only chemicals involved. I believe there's a chemical cocktail. And that bonding and even love is really the consequence of this chemical cocktail acting in the brain in these reward areas. So for example, oxytocin and vasopressin, I already told you about what we know that they do is they increase the salience of social stimuli. They make your brain think that the social world around you is the most important. Imagine the mother when she's nursing the baby. What oxytocin is doing is making her think that baby is the most important thing in her world. But we also know that dopamine is important. Dopamine is a molecule that's released when people take cocaine, or when you eat some chocolate, and you ride a roller coaster, or when you have sex. It gives you that excitement, the, the exhilaration. And other molecules, uh, opiates in the brain. Heroin is an opiate, but we have our own opiates, and that's what gives us pleasure. If you block those receptors, you also don't get a bond. So all of these things are acting together when two individuals are together and culminating in the formation of a bond. And, I, and I, I have this model. This is what I believe is happening when an animal forms bonds, or maybe when humans form bonds. But these are, let's say that this is a rat. So rats are not monogamous. The rat mates. When they mate, they get the somatosensory stimulation of the partner. Comes up, activates an area called the VTA, which then releases dopamine into these reward areas. And the animal says, wow, that was good. Sex is good. Sex is rewarding. We know even for a rat, sex is rewar rewarding because you can get a male rat to press a lever many, many times to get a female rat to drop out of the ceiling. <laughs> for, but for rats, they say that they made it and it was exciting. And their brain says, wow, I want to do that again. Where, let me find another female. But for prairie voles, it's different because they also are experiencing that dopamine but they're also releasing this oxytocin into these brain areas that are involved in addiction and reward. And it's focusing the attention to the odor and the signatures of their partner. Or vasopressin if they're male, sorry. Vasopressin if they are male. And it is linking in their brain the scent of their partner with their pleasure that they were just experiencing. And so they form an association between those two things. And they want to spend the rest of their time 
with that individual who gave them that experience. So there's really a lot of parallels between love and addiction. They're the same neurochemistry, the same neural circuitry. And sometimes you, 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 if you have children, you, you'll see that the kinds of things that they do often when they're in love seems very similar to what an addict might do. It's many things they do irrational. And there's also, um, there's different aspects of love. There's the formation of love, which is very exhilarating. But there's also another component, and that is when that love is disrupted. Rejection, loss, grieving. And what we find in our animal models, if that we take an animal that's formed a pair bond, and when we take that partner away just for a few days, they go through the symptoms that are very similar to withdrawal from cocaine or heroin. They get elevation of molecules called CRF. Their cortisol, their stress levels go up, their adrenals get larger, and they become depressed. But we can prevent that whole process just by infusing a single molecule into the brain, CRF receptor antagonist. So this shows us, all the experiments that I've shown you so far, show you that single molecules can have a really profound impact on how we relate to others, the formation of these bonds. Now, of course, um, you may be thinking about, you know, these are voles. Of course, we are much more complex than that, and, and indeed, we are much more complex. But I want to make the argument that the same kind of processes that I've discovered in voles are happening in humans. And I'm just going to show you some examples of that. Just in the last couple of years, there's been studies that have taken our vol work and looked at humans and looked at people that were in live-in relationships and asked them all kinds of questions about how they relate to each other, the quality of their relationships. And what they found is that in human males, the version that there are different types of vasopressin receptors. Some people have different uh, longer version or a shorter version. The type of vasopressin receptor gene that they have predicts the quality of the pair bond in that relationship just as it does in voles. And similarly, in human females, variations in the oxytocin receptor gene predicts the quality of the relationship. That's amazing. That's fascinating to me. And there's been a lot of studies. Just in the past, say, five years, people have began to do the kinds of things that we did in voles in humans by taking human subjects and giving them sniffs of oxytocin and see what happens. Now, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples that I find fascinating. Paper just came out last uh, November where a German group gave men who were either in a monogamous relationship or single injections of oxytocin or placebo, and then they had an attractive German experimenter stand at some distance, and they asked her to walk towards him and asked him to say when she began to feel uncomfortable. They thought maybe oxytocin would make them want the female to be closer, but what happened was it had no effect on the single men. But for the man that was in the monogamous relationship, he asked her to stop further away. So the, the authors conclude that maybe oxytocin is helping to maintain that relationship by keeping attractive women at a distance. <laughs> so their, conclu their conclusions was if you want to keep your uh, uh, partner faithful, you need to keep his oxytocin levels high. <laughs> Other studies have shown that if you in, in, uh, inhale oxytocin, it increases your trust. You're more likely to trust others with your money, thinking they'll pay you back. It increases eye contact, the amount of time that you spend looking into the eyes of others. It also increases the ability to read the emotions of others. Just by looking at the eyes, our brains focus on the faces and look at the muscles, contractions, and, and movements, and we can infer what the other person is thinking. And oxytocin helps that. It also helps improves empathy. It helps us understand what's, what the other person is going through. And so um, I had this wonderful experience of the last couple of years of putting together the research that's been done in animals, not just on bonding, but in sexuality, maternal behavior, uh, bonding, cheating, infidelity, in animals, and comparing that to what's known in humans and seeing that there are really remarkable parallels that have been going on. And I think that's very exciting. But actually, what I've realized is that the work that we're doing here not only tells us something about humanity, but it also has some really remarkable clinical implications. Based on the work on voles and some of our other work done in mice, people began to ask if oxytocin increases social relationships, the ability to relate to others, to look into the eyes of others, 
empathy. Might it be useful for improving social functioning in disorders such as autism? There's been a number of studies now that have shown that sniffing oxytocin can increase some aspect of social functioning in autism. There are probably dozens of clinical trials going on around, around the world now looking at just this. But I want to make the point that this is certainly not a, it's not a cure. It has some effect. It's promising. But there's a big limitation in the sense that when you sniff oxytocin, only a small amount gets into the brain. Nothing, the, the, the subject is not experiencing anything like a mother feels when she is nursing that baby, when that, those neural signals are coming up and stimulating her oxytocin release. What if we could harness the power of that chemistry that a mother experiences to activate the social brain of individuals who have a disrupted social brain, such as in autism or even schizophrenia? So this is something that we've been working here at Emory in my lab, is to try to figure out how can we take advantage of the chemistry to improve social functioning. And just to give you a brief idea, what we're thinking about is looking at those brain cells that are making oxytocin, that are releasing it in a mother when she's nursing. And if we could identify molecules, receptors that are on those neurons, and we can identify chemicals, drugs that have already been developed that activate those receptors, then we could stimulate oxytocin release directly in the brain, in the areas of the brain that are responsible for this emotional connection between individuals. And I'll just say that we have uh, developed such a drug um, that it works in prairie voles to simulate their bond, and we're beginning clinical trials in humans to see if it has a similar effect in humans. Um, but I think that this, this approach, this idea, that you can understand the chemistry between in relationships, and how do we, we can use that to help solve some of the problems in diseases like autism is very important. So this is very exciting to me, the idea that you can use animals to understand chemistry, to do things that you can never do in a human. But that can somehow translate into uh, an improvement in clinical disorders. And, and based on this idea, we started here at Emory, the Center for Translational Social Neuroscience. And the idea behind that is that there are a lot of people here that are doing basic neuroscience, trying to understand how do we relate to others, both in animals and in humans. We have also other uh, great institutions here that are trying to treat autism, like the Marcus Autism Center. And the idea behind this center is to try to get the people together that work with animals, understanding the basic science with the clinicians, and let's figure out how to uh, transform that basic science information into clinical treatments. Thank you.